So, so the Torah tells us that after a person brings the Bikurim, makes the declaration, and he's, he's given away all the tithes. And he says, Hashkifo Mimot Kochko, Minashamayim. Now, in Hebrew, the word Hashkifo means a very deliberate gazing. Lashkif. Now we refer to uh, perspective, it's called Hashkofa. Right? Hashkofa is perspective. That means you have a certain way of seeing something in a very specific way. So the expression, to see means it can be in a very general way. It's a very broad spectrum seeing, you see specifically, you see generally, you have an inkling, but Ashkifa is a very deliberate, specific type of gazing. So Hashkif Mot Kochko, you should gaze from your holy abode, Mina Shamayim from heaven, Ovorech Esamcho Es Yisrael, your people, Yisrael, And the earth that you've given us, as you promised to our forefathers, firstly, when you make the supplication, he's asking, what do we have to add? Es Yisroel. Es Yisroel. Your people, Yisroel. God has no other people other than, than Klal Yisroel. But yet, when we say he should bless us, he should gaze from heaven and bless us, it's Abcho Yisrael, your people Israel. In an earlier parsha, we find that the word B'nai, the words B'nai Yisrael are mentioned in one post five times. There's no usage of pronouns. B'nai Yisrael mentioned over and over in one post five times. We know the Torah, when it chooses to use verbiage, it's something very specific. There's nothing superfluous. So if that's the case, why does the Torah repeat itself five times? And one post of B'nai Yisrael. So the Midrash tells us that a person has a child that he loves or his wife, he never refers to the child with a pronoun. It's always by name. Why? Because whenever the parent mentions the name of that child, it evokes a feeling of love and warmth when he mentions that name, rather than saying him or her, by mentioning the name. So that that the Torah mentions, says the word B'nai Yisrael, those words, five times in St. Pasuk, it's an expression of love that he has for us. Now the question is, well, why is it mentioned five times? Why not four times? So Rashi says over there, based on the Midrash, it cor- corresponds to the Hamisha from Shitola. It corresponds to the five books of the Torah. So the way we explained it then was, why are the Jews so special? Why do we have that special place in Kaviyochel, God's heart, and God's vision? Why? Because we accepted the Torah. That that it mentions, which is an expression of endearment, is the Torah, by mentioning the five times, it's because we accepted the Torah, which is five. That's how we explain Rashi over there. Of course, if not for us, the world wouldn't continue. So the whole value of existence is only because of Bnei Yisrael. Therefore, there's a special endearment, and therefore the, the words Bnei Yisrael mentioned five times. We're asking God to gaze, to, be very, give, to see us in a very specific, exacting way. Your people... Abcha es Yisrael. When we mentioned Yisrael, first of all, why we called Yisrael? We're called Bnei Yisrael. We're not called Bnei Yaakov, right? The children of Yaakov called Bnei Yaakov. Also, we're called Bnei Yisrael, but we're called Bnei Yisrael. Why was Yaakov? Why was he given that additional name Yisrael? Because when he had fought the angel, and he was victorious over the angel, so the angel said, and Hashem says later, the name will be Yisrael in addition to Yaakov. Because you lorded over God and man, and you were victorious, therefore you are Yisrael. Yisrael, that appellation is the spiritual profile of the Jew. That's what we're part of eternity. It's Amcha, we're not just Amcha. 
which is not an ordinary nation. It's Amchis Yisrael. It evokes Tashem by saying Yisrael, we are that spiritual people. We are, we descend from what? From, from, from Yaakov. We have that characteristic. We have that same neshama, which is part of eternity, which corresponds to every aspect of Torah. Let's talk about Hashkifa. We find that when the angels had left Avram Avinu, the three angels who Avram had hosted, so it says two of them went to Sodom. What happened to the third one? The third one came to inform Sori Menu that she was going to have a child. It was not necessary for him to continue. But two of them continued to snow. Why did they go to snow? One went to save Lot. The one who came to heal Avram Avinu went to save Lot. That's Raphael. And Gabriel, Gabriel, Dark Angel, went to destroy Sodom. That's what they were two. So uh, when they went, after he, he, Avram Avinu, Concluded his dialogue with Hashem. Where originally, he had something, and maybe there's 50 tzaddikim, maybe the 45, and so on and so forth. God says, There's no tzaddikim. They will be destroyed. So then now they're going to Sodom, and it says, Sodom. They gazed on Sodom. The angels that go on Sodom, they gazed. So Rashi says, The words gazing, whatever it says gazing, it means midas adin. God will means the attribute of justice. They, they're going to destroy Sodom. That's the Ashkifu. And here we find the word Hashkifu, by Hashkifa no, to gaze in a very exacting way in the context of the ultimate bracha. So Rashi cites Chazal elsewhere that we find that when you give matas adim, when you give charity, I mean, the Kohen, the Levi, the widow, the convert who does not share in the land. You're doing an act of Gemilas Chesed. That doing Gemilas Chesed could overturn Midas Adin to Midas Arachmin. That's Hashkifa. But what's, what is the Mida Kenegad Mida? What is Mida, why is Midas Adin to be Mashkif? To be very exacting. Because that's what Midas Adin is, exacting. When Hashem is exacting, then you actually, a person gets the brunt of the of the law. But if Hashem is willing to give you some leeway, not to give you the full brunt, that's not Lashkif. That's not an evaluation, which is to be immediately delivered. Lashkif, I mean, so therefore, just as Midas Adin is exacting, why did the person give charity to the poor person? Why did he take the poor person into account and have that level of consideration? Because he went and he appreciates the predicament and the situation of the poor person. So therefore, asking Hashem, just as we were mashkif, as we were focused on the needs of the levy, the, the kohen, the convert, the poor, the widow, the orphan, he should also meet a connected midah to gaze upon us in that exacting way in the in what? In the positive. So therefore, the same term used by, regarding Midas Adin, the attribute of justice, we find in God the attribute of mercy and the chesed. Therefore, the term hashkif mot kochko, we're asking Hashem to gaze, to evaluate what we've done in terms of Midas and Agmida, measure for measure, and therefore, Ovarechas Amcho Es Yisrael, and the earth which you gave us, which is the land of Eretz Zomus Gosh. What do we have to refer to it? The land that you promised our forefathers. What do we have to refer to it? The land which flows with milk and honey. You know, for Hashem to perform a miracle, you have to have a special merit. And even if you have a special merit, miracles don't come easy. That because God's not going to alter nature to bring about a supernatural event unless it's something which is going to be monumental. So if that's the case, gaze upon us and bless the land, the land every result is called Midosh. I'll give you an example. You have desert land and you pray to Hashem, you should gaze upon this location and it should flow with milk and the land and should have only bounty and blessing and everything. 
a, the desert is a location of desolation, total desolation. Nothing grows there. And all of a sudden, you have a lush forest. You have orchards, you have vineyards, you know, something that's miraculous. Eretz soil within its makeup is naturally a land that flows with milk and honey. However, if we misbehave, if we transgress, Hashem turns off the tap. When he turns on back on the tap, when we're worthy and deserving, it's not a miracle because that's within the capacity of the land because the land in its essence is a land that flows with milk and honey. You understand? If we have given our portion be the Sahara Desert and we beg all of a sudden Sahara Desert becomes an oasis and everything grows there and there's bounty there, that, that's an obvious miracle. Eretz Yisrael, it depends based on our behavior. We behave properly and we do exactly our lifestyle, our baby conforms with the Torah. Then the land functions as Eretz Cholvodvosh. That is, that's the essence of the land. It's like a person fertilizes his property and he plants it properly. It's going to give forth its bounty. And Eretz Yisrael, it only functions within the capacity of Eretz Yisrael Cholvodvosh if the Jews behave within the spiritual realm. You ate properly, this land functions as Eretz Cholvodvosh. You misbehave, then it becomes total desolation. But it's not, it's not a miracle. The other side of the coin is not a miracle because that's the nature of the land and nobody understands that, but that is the reality. It has to meet certain criteria of spirituality. Then it, then it, it functions in its essence. Its essence of Eretz is Eretz Cholvodvosh. Therefore, it's not a miracle. That's why when we refer to the land that you promised to our forefathers and we have to be specific. And what is that land? A land that flows with milk and honey for that reason. Shlishi, Parshish Kisavo, Tosek Tezayim. Hayom Azeh Hashem Elkechem Tzav Cholasus Zachukim O'Eler. Today God is commanding you to do these statutes, Besa Mishpotim, and the laws, the Shamarta Vosisoso. You should retain them, mean review them, and actualize them at what level? With all your hearts and with all your souls, meaning fully invested. So Rachi says, What's Hayom Azer? Hashem El Kechem et Savcho. What does he have to say today? God is commanding you. When we do the mitzvahs, it should be as if they were communicated, transmitted today. It's now after nearly 4,000 years in Sinai. When we put on your tefillin, when you do a mitzvah, you be the way you should experience it is if it's the first time or it's recently given to you. So it still has that uniqueness and you relate to it differently. Okay? I always say, you know, the Shulchan rules that when you put on your tefillin, besides having in mind that you're doing the mitzvah, you have to have other things in mind, specifically regarding the tefillin. When you put the tefillin shel yad on your upper arm, which corresponds to your heart, which is your, your emotion and your feeling, you're supposed to have in mind that you're putting on the tefillin, firstly, to fulfill the mitzvah of tefillin, which is a positive commandment. In addition, you're dedicating your heart to God. That's what you have to have in mind. In addition, you're supposed to think you see some Mitzrayim. Because the parshas, the, the parchments in mention you see some Mitzrayim. God took us out of Egypt. When you put the shell rosh on your head, which corresponds to the brain, you're supposed to think, in, in addition that you're filling the midst of putting fill on your head, positive commandment, you're dedicating your intellect to God. That little extra bit of thought, it adds a dimension to the mitzvah that you touch differently. You put it on by rote. I'm putting on my tefillin, my hand, my rote, my head. Okay. You know you're putting on tefillin, but it, you're not touched by it. But if you stop to think of fulfilling the commandment of tefillin, when you say the brocha, when you tighten that knot, and simultaneously, <clears throat> I'm dedicating my heart to God. 
And remembering Hashem took us out of Egypt, the Sharosh, my intellect, you know what I mean? I'm dedicating my intellect to God. And you mean the whole value is, is your, your, your intellect, intellectual capacity. You, you touched. Every time you think about it, you're touched by it. That's Hayom. It gives it a whole different dimension. As a result of that, the mitzvah is always continuously retaining its uniqueness. It's not something you do by rote. Because something which is unique, it's something which you focus on and you touch by it. And I always say, we say in the, at night, the Krishma before the Birchus Krishma, the bracha that precedes the Shema, we say, Kehem Chayenu Vorokhemenu. Kehem Chayenu Vor, it's our life and the length of our days. When you live your life, do you do life or do you live life? Personally, I'm going to do this mitzvah. I mean, you're doing the mitzvah, you're actualizing it, but how do you experience? Kehem Chayenu. It's our life, it's the length of our days. That's the way you're supposed to experience it. I mean, you have to be touched. The only way you're touched by something, if you sense its uniqueness and why it's so special. And that's Hayom. Earlier, in, we had by in Parshish uh, Eschanan, Anoch Mitzav Hayom, when we said the first par paragraph of the Shema, Yu Be'inecho Kechadoshos, and Rashi decides the the Sifri, you cannot compare a new proclamation, an old proclamation to a new proclamation. The king crier reads a proclamation you've heard it a thousand times. Okay, I've heard it before. But if it's a new proclamation, everybody has an interest in hearing what it's all about. An old pop proclamation, you get tired of it. You get worn down. It's a new proclamation, you have that interest. And, and what is it based upon? If you have the love for God, love always keeps it fresh and vibrant. But if you do it not out of love, just as obligation, then it becomes old hat and automatically, or it's inevitable, it becomes rote. It becomes rote Judaism. But if you have Ava Hashem, and before you do the mitzvah, you think about what it is and what, what the value is and how fortunate you are, we see every morning, Ashreinu matov chelkenu ma'anon goreleinu, ma'yofu shoseinu. Ashreinu matov chelkenu. How fortunate we are because of our portion. Ma'anon goreleinu. And how pleasant is our lot. That's what we say. So if you're saying it, and you focus on that, and you understand its value, you're touched by it. And that's the hayo. Because if you see it as something which is Recent or today, it gives it a different dimension of value. We're going to stop here. Uh, I can ask a question. You can answer it.